Good morning, everyone. Due to the severe weather this morning, we canceled all the services and afternoon activities. So I want to share with you the message that I was planning to preach this morning. The sermon script will be posted on the weekly Friday e-letter as well. Today we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s day and reflect on his legacy and his dream for America, including you and me. I want to invite you to listen to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48, as we think about what we can do together to carry on Dr. King's legacy. Here's the word of God. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward you, do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Good morning, justice seekers and peacemakers. America, our beloved country, is at the crossroad. Democracy is in crisis. The political landscape of the United States is highly polarized between Democrats and Republicans between the rich and the poor, between color lines. Racism is ramping up, while black communities are devastated by mass incarceration and extreme poverty. White Christian nationalism as a pseudo-Christian sect, as a fascist ideology is on the rise to threaten our democratic and Christian identity. Militarism has never been decreasing since the birth of our country because it has been an important vehicle for America's perpetual warfare presence around the globe. Economic exploitation is already globalized over 400 years by European and American colonization and their perpetual neocolonial economic power to maximize profits for transnational corporations. Gun safety issues are not reserved at all, which is deeply rooted in America's racial history while we have witnessed so many victims from those mass shootings at schools like Sandy Hook, Newton, and Rob Uvalde, and churches and synagogues and mosques and even in our backyard. As global warming is becoming more and more threatening to the whole planet, that puts us in an extreme disparity between the rich countries and the poor countries in terms of economic and political stabilities. It causes huge human migration and displacement of so many developing countries around the world. I don't want to portray our society in a gloomy and pessimistic way. But as James Baldwin, a prominent African-American writer, said that history is not about the past, but about the present. It is something that we carry within us. What you have seen is is the continuum of something that has been carried through our present moment. Those existential threats are overwhelming us 
sometimes, and I am worried about our future. These existential threats are already addressed by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 57 years ago. It was less than a year before he was assassinated that he delivered the three evils of society at the National Conference on New Politics in August 1967, in which he addressed the giant triplet of racism, economic inequality, and militarism that were threatening our national global societies. His prophetic voice is still vivid and still relevant, and it is carried through our present moment. Every single issue that is addressed is interconnected. Dr. King insisted in this address that, quote, it really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly." Unquote. We cannot think of economic inequality without racial justice because the poor people are mostly the African-American communities in America. Since the birth of our country, slavery had been perpetuated for economic prosperity, for example, cotton plantation, and is exploitation of slave laborers from West Africa. But race was invented to perpetuate and justify transatlantic West African slave trade and soon slavery system in America. Slavery, racism, economic exploitation are interconnected. In the 19th century, the most expensive commodity was a slave. Without slave laborers, there would be no economic power in America, nor is prosperity that we are benefited from. In Charleston, South Carolina, those African slaves built all the major city buildings and houses in 18th and 19th century. If you go and take a look at all the brick buildings in the town, you may notice that there are lots of fingerprints on the brick walls because the slaves of Charleston wanted to leave their traces on those buildings to remind all that they built the city. In the cotton industry, in 1790, the yearly cotton production was just 1.5 million pounds. In 1860, it increased by 2.3 billion pounds. It indicated the huge influx of slaves imported to America during the time. Some historians have estimated in six to seven million enslaved people were imported to the New World during the, during the 18th century alone. Along with the astronomical economic profits from the cotton production, the number of slaves were increased as well by breeding themselves or raping by slave owners. So without the labors of those enslaved people from Africa, there would be no economic prosperity in America. Michelle Alexandria, who wrote a book called the new Jim Crow insist that mass incarceration puts a young African-American young man in prison disproportionately. By the way, the United States has the biggest prison population in the world, which is 2.3 million plus three or four millions under probation. This is another example of systemic racism in America. It is hard to imagine that when young men were incarcerated, their families and communities would be devastated 
and they would be put in the constant cycle of extreme poverty. And militarism in America is also very gloomy and very challenging to grasp. Since the war on terror in 2001, it has taken 1 million lives and cost more than $8 trillion. While we have seen the rise of the great power rivalry that is leading into a new Cold War in Ukraine, Middle East, China, and Russia, we are spending $750 billion per year for military defense budget, which is almost a half of the world military expenditure. The United States deploys some 750 military bases in 80 countries and territories around the world. No other country in human history, including Rome and Persia or China, has had such a dominant military presence in the world. But we have to ask ourselves whether, whether our global military presence can mitigate regional conflicts and wars or not, and whether we can still make peace on earth by those military powers. We are living in a world filled with sounds that ring out around us. I hear a sound from weapons of mass destruction, from the growl, growl of empty stomachs, to the echo of the gunshot on the street or at, at schools, to the outcry of the traumatized people by systemic injustice and oppression and discrimination to the screams of the displaced people in the southern borders. How far can it carry those heavy burdens? How long can we wait until justice roars down like waters and righteousness like the mighty stream? How long can we truly transform the world so that as Jesus prays, God's kingdom come, God's will be done on earth? How can we? When can we fulfill the dream that Dr. King dreamt? The dream that our children would live in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but, the, but by the content of their character. The dream that we can turn a sword to the plowshare, a gun that kills lives, to a hammer to build a house. Greed that promotes the inequalities to fairness that creates the equal opportunities for all. Remember, God heard the outcry of the Israelites under their slavery in Egypt. God looked up on them. God took notice of them. At last, God liberated them from slavery in Egypt. So I believe the same God is calling us to hear the cry of the alienated. The same God is calling us to rehearse a reign of God that envisions Dr. King's dream, our dream, and America's dream, in which all are welcome, in which there is no more war, in which there is no more inequalities, in which there is no discrimination. And I hope we can let freedom ring at last. To this end, like Jesus, we have to love our enemies. We have to love the unlovable. Jesus is right. Jesus is always right. The root cause of all those human outcries is that we, you and I, have a tendency to see things based on the oppositional thinking between good and evil or between friends and enemies, between us and them. We have a tendency to build wars between us and them. If they are not our friends or allies, then they are enemies. If they are not like-minded with us, then they are strangers or even enemies. If they are not from the same culture that we are from, if they are not speaking the same language of uh, ours, or if they are not from the same country or same clan 
or the same ancestors or the same race. They are different or they are less than human or even our enemies. If we cannot overcome these barriers, we cannot live together in peace and in perfect harmony. It causes constant wars and crimes. There would be no peace at all. So friends, we have to love our enemies, no matter who they are. Jesus is right. If we love our enemies, that is the only way to bring peace on earth. That is the love that manifests the God's justice and love, which passes all human understandings, all human knowledges, all human arrogance and power, will transform heart of the people. Jesus is right. If we love enemies, everyone becomes our friends beyond color lines, beyond the red linings, beyond the new gym calls, beyond the nation's borders, beyond the economic inequality, beyond the gender inequality. The wars that we built in the past were dividing us and them. The same wars, however, that we break down will open up a gateway to freedom and equality and human dignity. Jesus is absolutely right. I mean, this is the only way for God's kingdom. We pray every day the prayer Jesus taught. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespass against us. Forgiving those who harm us and persecute us, who are our enemies, is the only way to bring God's kingdom, God's peace and justice to our country, to our community, to our places. No matter how rich you are, no matter how much educated you are, no matter how tall you are, no matter how much colored your skins are, no matter how powerful you are, God doesn't care about those human status quo, but rather God does care about your heart about whether you love your enemies or not, or about whether you love the unlovable or not. This is the only way for peace. Jesus is right, always right. Jesus said, therefore, just as your heavenly Father is perfect in showing love to everyone, so also you must be perfect in love. In other words, we can be perfect. It may cost our own sacrifices like Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross, but it will save a lot more lives than the perpetual killing of human life. By loving our enemies, we can stop the vicious circle of evil doings, injustice, and killings. I'm not only speaking to you, but speaking to the nation and the world. Jesus says to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of God in heaven. For God makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends the rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. But the power of love will change the course of evils and stop injustice and bring peace at last. Love wins at last. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are the God of justice and love and peace. May your peace prevail over the land of freedom where everyone is equally treated as your beloved children. May our church step up for justice to follow Jesus' commandment, love our enemies. May we boldly pro proclaim that we will shine the light of hope for the whole world by that love. Thank you, God, for your grace upon grace. Keep us all safe in this weather. We pray that those unsheltered people may have a home and shelter for their own well-being. 
May the grace of Jesus Christ, the everlasting love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.